to God's Great Community Church. Amen. It's been a few weeks and we haven't posted a number of Bible studies. We've been doing some other things this, this past month in the month of October. Had a great revival at our church with people, great speakers coming in. And we pray that the church is revived. Those of you who don't know it, revival is about the people in the church who are called of God, already saints. That's what revival is really about. We need the people inside to be revived. So that's what we were working on this past month. So we didn't do a lot of posting, amen, of Bible studies. But we're back and we're going to do some more posting of Bible studies. For those of you who've been listening in, we appreciate you doing that. And we pray that God has been blessing you through the Bible studies that we have posted thus far. Now, today is November the 3rd, 2021. Can you believe it? The year is moving along swiftly. Time is coming to a close. So we need to be about our father's business and we're going to talk about something that's going to help us, I do believe, to think in that realm. Amen. Today on this Bible class. Let's have a word of prayer, do our housekeeping as we normally do, and launch into this Bible study. Father, in your blessed name, we thank you for your kindness, your goodness, your mercy. We thank you for those who are listening into the Bible study. We thank you for what you have given us and ask you, Lord, to enlighten us to your word. Let your word go through us and cause us to want to walk closer to you. We give you the praise and glory for all that you've done, for your love, your grace, and your tender mercy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, amen. Don't forget our housekeeping. Whatever you do, go to our website page, download this document so that you can keep this for your records. It'll be on our webpage for some time because they tend to drop off after a while and they move up. We can only keep a certain number on there, but you can go to the web page and download this document so that you can follow along with it during your records as you listen to the Bible study. Now, number two, don't forget if you have any questions or comments to email us at worship at godswaytoday.org. We would love to hear from you. We don't get a lot of uh, feedback from a lot of people sometimes, and that's okay. Some people don't feel comfortable doing that or don't have the time or whatever the case may be. But we want you to know that we welcome that feedback, whatever it may be. Our goal is to make sure that we deliver to you the best Word of God that we can, uh, to rightly divide the Word of God, to make sure that you get what God wants you to have from the Bible study. Amen? That's our goal. That's what we're shooting for. Amen? And that's what we want you to receive. Now, with no further delay, let's launch into the Bible study that we have for today. I'd like to give the subject today, live for the glory of God. This is what we're talking about today, live for for the glory of God. We're going to go to some scriptures, and I usually don't like to give more than one opening text scripture, but today I'm going to give you a couple of those uh, because of how Paul writes them, and I'll explain a little bit about that later. So I'm going to be reading from the King James Version of the Bible, which is my custom, but follow along in whatever version that you have. Now, Romans chapter number 8, verse 8. And verse 36 is our first scripture, and then we'll be going to 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, verse number 31, all right? Romans chapter 8, Paul reads, and he says this, For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. Verse number 36, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, verse number 31. Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Now, I just want to uh, reiterate some of those scriptures in just a minute, but as again, our subject is live for the glory of God. Uh, recently, I read an article, and I'll, I'll start off with this. Recently, I read an article written by a, a minister, uh, a man in a church uh, in the New York, I think it was, and he gave his testimony. This was in a Christian magazine, and he gave his testimony. His testimony included his life and how when he grew up in New York, he was a gangbanger, and he experimented with drugs and all this sort of thing. And then God saved him, brought him out of that gang life, baptized him in the name of Jesus, filled him with the gift of the Holy Ghost, and he has been living for God for the last 43 years. It's a great testimony. Amen. I won't give the, the gentleman's name because I haven't had permission to do that, but I will say this. The testimony inspired me, and what inspired me even more when I read the article was this. He said in the article that he had gone through 
two different bouts with cancer. Amen. The first time back in 2012, I do believe it was, he went through that whole thing of, of a particular type of cancer and God healed him of that. Then in 2020, just recently last year, uh, uh, he was diagnosed with stomach cancer. And he, as he wrote the article, which was back in September uh, time frame, as he wrote the article, he said he was still going through chemotherapy. But this is what he said that inspired me and caused me to really want to do this Bible study today. He said that no matter what happens to him, he just wants to live for the glory of God. I thought that was wonderful. Whether he dies or whether he makes it through the cancer or whether God brings him to another place for trial, it wasn't important to him. In his mind, what was most important to him was that through his living, through his suffering, through whatever he had to deal with, he was exemplifying God. He was living in a way that God would get the glory from his life. I said to myself as I began to listen and read that particular article, what a great thought that we should get across to the people of the world today. The saints of the Most High God, we really need to get this in our spirits. I'm going to help somebody today, hopefully with this Bible study, and I hope that God will put this in your heart. The world is, has changed. The COVID virus has caused many people to be afraid. Some are, have died. Some are not with us. And there are people who are still living in fear. There are people who don't know uh, what they're going to do next week. None of us know what's going to come down the pipe. I read an article in a news magazine just recently that said, uh, COVID is here to stay. Amen. That, the, and that's, that may be true. We don't know if it's going away. No one really knows. And we don't know if something's going to come along after COVID. We have no idea. But here's what we do know. Here's the good news. Jesus is here to stay too. Amen. He's not going anywhere. Amen. And as long as he's alive, that means his church, the people who are born again believers, have a call on our lives to exemplify and glorify God in our lives in such a way that it brings peace. It brings some hope. It brings some some ideal that we can make it something that gives the people in the world when they're going through all of this trouble we need to have a beacon of light shining through the people in the church so that the world knows that just because things don't look so good on the outside, around us, in the economy, with our politics, with our racial uh, discriminations or whatever the things are going on in society, there is still a God and he is showing himself mighty in the person of his people. And this is what I want to talk about today. We need to live to the glory of God. Amen. And that's what our subject is. We're going to get to that. So let's talk about it right now. Now, first of all, let's talk about glory. What do we mean by glory? What is glory? I'm going to give you a definition straight out of Zondervan's Bible Dictionary uh, because I think this is a very good definition and the way they explain it, I like this because glory can mean a number of things and we see the word used many, many times in the Bible. We see examples of it in the Old and the New Testament, but I want to give you a definition so that you can actually get an idea of what glory is as pertains to Jesus Christ and what we're going to talk about today. Glory is defined, says Zondervan, as the exhibition of the excellence. Now listen to this. The exhibition of the excellence of the subject to which it is ascribed. Now what does that mean? <laughs> the exhibiting of excellence is what it's saying. Glory is when excellence is exhibited by the particular subject or the particular person or the particular thing to which the glory has been ascribed or assigned to. So in other words... When it concerns God, it is the display of God's divine attributes and his perfections. Now, remember that. So when we give God glory, we are dealing with displaying God's divine attributes or qualities and his perfection. Wow, we're going to do that. Paul said whether we live or die, whether we are here or there, whether we, no matter what we do, we belong to the Lord. So therefore, we ought to do what? Live in everything we do, Paul said, to the glory of God. What Paul was trying to tell the people in the opening text that we read, that we are to live in such a way that no matter what we do, where we go, how we act, how we dress, how we think, how we behave among people, it glorifies or brings a, an exhibition or exhibits. Our lives exhibit the excellence 
and the power and majesty of God and his perfection. Now, when you see something that, or you comprehend something that represents the invisible quality of God and you see it in a visible way, that is the glory of God. For example, when you look at the world that the world was created, the Bible talks about that in Romans chapter 1, verse 20. I think I put that in your notes. That the invisible things of God through the creation of the world are clearly seen, right? Being understood by the things that are made. So in other words, if we would pay attention to the beauty of the world, to the order of the universe, to the, to the, to the uh, uh, configuration of the constellation of the stars, how the moon is designed, how the sun is just where it needs to be so that we don't burn up or freeze, right? If we would take a look at those things that are visible to us, amen, the singing of the birds, amen, the migration of animals, the way the ocean tide comes and goes in a rhythmic fashion on its own. If we would actually just observe those things, we would understand the invisible things of God. Thereby, we would see some visible attribute of God in a visible context and therefore understand the glory of God. Amen. This is what's very powerful about what God has done. So, glory means then, it means splendor. It means majesty, magnificence. It means grandeur, okay? It, it means, amen, that, uh, that God is great and he's powerful and awesome. That's what glory is. That's one area of glory and context. And we see in the Old Testament where God demonstrated his glory in many ways. For example, the burning bush with Moses. Uh, we see the if the fire by night that he led the Israelites through the wilderness, the pillar of uh, the cloud or the pillar of the fire. We see the fire that came down uh, over the tabernacle when the priests made the offering and the holies of holies that went and sprinkled the blood. And God communed with Moses above the mercy seat. The people saw that. We call that the Shekinah glory. And that's talked about in a number of places in the Bible. So that's what glory is. It can also mean the praise and the beauty of God. So when we live to the glory of God, we give God praise. We show the world the praise of God. We show the world the beauty of God. We show the world the excellence, the magnificence, the awesomeness, and the grandeur of God. And that's what we're talking about. How do we do that? How do we live in such a way that in everything we do, we are giving God glory through our lives? That's what that man was talking about. That's, I could feel that in his voice as he spoke about how God has brought him out of so many things in his gang-infested life, in his drug-infested life, and now has made him a child of the king for 43 years. And he just said, no matter whether I live or die, I just want to bring glory to God. I think that is so wonderful. I think it's so inspiring. It moves me when I think about it, that somebody wants to live that way. And I think that's what you and I should want to do to live our lives to the glory of God. Amen. So let's talk about that in a little bit more depth. Amen. I get emotional and, and really moved by the Spirit of God when I begin to think about these things. And I thank God for that. I can feel God moving as I speak. Amen. About his glory and wanting to live a life that exemplifies that glory. Amen. Let's go into the word of God into our next scripture. Everything, remember this, everything that God does is ultimately for his glory. Now we got to get this down if we're going to ever live for the glory of God. Psalms chapter 19 verse number one, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament show his handiwork. Get that. What is that? The heavens, we know there are several heavens. The Bible talks about the third heaven. John said, I was caught up into the third heaven, right? Okay, or Paul said that, I was caught up into the third heaven. Amen. So we do know that there is a heaven in terms of when the Bible talks about firmament, there is the sky above us, the earth around us, or the air around us that we breathe, that is known as the firmament. Amen. But because there are levels of that, amen, we know that that's what it's talking about. So even the air we breathe, even the skies and the heavens, because there are more than one level of heaven, even the heavens declare God's handiwork. How do they do that? They show it through physical observations that we can see the handiwork of God. Have you ever thought about how a cloud just hangs up there where it is? Have you ever thought about that? I'd lay down on my back when I was a kid and just look at the clouds. You, you've probably done that too. The clouds just hang up there. Who's hanging them up there? Okay, They just stay there. Why don't they just drop down to the ground? They just float along there and they make these beautiful patterns. Isn't that right? 
And when the sun hits the clouds, just right after it rains or something, you get these orange glows, these dark grayish tones and a blends of pinks and all that. All of these things are things that declare the handiwork of God. Look at Habakkuk chapter number two, verse 14. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the earth. God had an intention from the very beginning when the scripture says God created the heavens and the earth. He wanted to show forth that he was God. Let me tell you something. No matter what people say to you, no matter what's going on in this world, God still has control. He has his glory that is being displayed through all the world. And he wants that glory to be displayed in your life and in my life as well, which is what we're talking about. Acts chapter 19, verse 13 to 16. Now, I won't read all this, but this is an account of the conversion of the Apostle Paul whose name was Saul, which Saul is his Hebrew name, okay, right? So when, before Paul became Paul, he was converted, right? And most of us know the story of his conversion as he was on the road to Damascus. Now, when Paul was on his way, God sent a message to a man named Ananias and told him to go lay his hands on Paul so that Paul could receive his sight. Because as you may recall, he was blind for three days and didn't eat anything while God was taking him to, to this court. Well, Ananias didn't want to do it. He had heard of Paul, and he told God that. We've heard of this guy, and this, this man is, is, has persecuted the church. But I want you to notice, pick up at verse number 16 and chapter number 9, the book of Acts. And I want to show you what God tells Ananias this. Listen to what he says. He says, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. He told Ananias, you go lay your hands on him because he's a chosen vessel to me, and I will show you what great things he must suffer for my sake. Now, see, here's what we got to remember, that God sometimes, and this is something that's hard for us to grasp and hard for us to understand, and because we're just human beings, okay? But sometimes God will show his glory through our human suffering. Let me say that again, and hopefully it'll help somebody and hurt no one. God will sometimes show and manifest his glory through our human suffering. The gentleman who wrote the article, I think he had that down. He understood that, that in his suffering, it's going to even bring glory to God. Somebody is going to be witness to. Somebody's going to ask him, how can you be so cheerful and you're hurting so bad? And he can tell them, you know, I was a gangbanger. You know, I used to be on LSD. I used to be on drugs. He named all these drugs that he was taking when he was a young man and how God brought him out of that. Amen. But he's, he would be able to tell somebody, all this, this is nothing. But one day when I was lost, God found me and brought me out of the club and out of the gang infested life and made me a minister of righteousness. See, that he has gotten that down, that he understands that even in his suffering, God's going to get glory. So God tells Ananias when, he, Ananias when he goes to Paul, he says, no, you go your way and lay your hands on him because I'm going to show this brother Paul what kind of suffering he must do for my namesake. Now, whenever you hear God talk about namesake, let me throw this out before we go on any further. Whenever we hear God say in the scriptures something is to be done for his namesake, it really means for his glory, okay? Because when we talk about God's name, his name is holy. His name is everlasting. His name is powerful, wonderful, everlasting father, on and on and on. The beginning and the end, the first and the last, right? The Alpha and the Omega, right? So his name is holy. He is Jehovah God. He is the God of all things. So when we hear him talk about doing something for his name's sake, it is to say to bring honor to bring praise, beauty, glory, and excellence and exaltation to my name or for my name, okay? That's what we're talking about. So when he says, I'm going to show Paul what he must do, how he must suffer to bring me honor. Look at that, somebody. Can I help somebody right here? We need to try to keep this in mind. Some people suffer more than others. Some people go through life and never seem to break a fingernail. And we don't understand why. Some people go through life and they seem like they're always going through this bout of suffering, always having this sickness. We don't understand why. But here's what we do know, that God gets honor from him that suffers and he wants honor from him that is not suffering. The one that is suffering may be going through it because the one who is not suffering could not handle it. Amen. So God picks somebody that can handle it. Here's a good example. Remember the story of Job? 
When God picked Job, when the devil came to, to, to God, God said to the devil, what? Have you considered my servant Job? God set him out there. He just set Job out there on the ledge, right? Have you considered him? That there's none like him in all the earth? Why? Because God knew that Job could handle it, and he did handle it. He passed the test, didn't he? He passed the test to teach you and I how God can still get the glory from our suffering and then exalt us in the end and make us great, no matter what our physical body is going through. This is very important. God does things for his glory, whether it's create the world, whether it's demonstrate through our sickness, whether it's demonstrate through our wealth or through our, our opposition to trouble or through our success. God has an intention to do all things so that he can be glorified because he is God. That's the first thing we're going to remember or we should remember if we want to live to the glory of God. Now, Jesus glorified God the Father in his life. He's our perfect example, isn't he? All right? The Bible says that we should follow in his footsteps. He's given us an example. Jesus Christ is the example that you and I should emulate. Matthew chapter 9, verse 6 through 8. Let's go over that. But that ye may know that the Son of Man had power on earth to forgive sins. Then said he to the sick of palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, go into thy house. And he arose and departed to his house. But when the multitude saw it, look what they did. They marveled and they glorified God. They gave praise to God because they saw God demonstrated in the power of Jesus Christ. This is important, how God manifested himself through Jesus' miracles and him working with men. Look at John chapter 8, verse 48 through 50. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, they're talking to Jesus, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil? Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. I seek not my own glory. Did you hear that? There is one that seeketh and judgeth. Look what Jesus said in verse 50. I seek not my own glory. Somebody say that with me. I seek not my own glory. We need to think about that because often in the world that we live in, we are not taught not to seek our own glory, are we? Okay, look what Jesus says here in John chapter 12, verse 27 and 28. Now is my tr soul troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I into this hour. Look at what he said. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Notice what he says. I'm going to bring glory to my name. How's God going to do that? Through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Jesus knew and submitted himself even at the point of death that his job was to bring glory to God. For the joy that was set before him, the Bible says, he endured the cross. Why? Because his endurance of his suffering would bring glory to God. This in itself, again, is an example of what we should say and what we should live as we go through various trials and tribulations in our life. Does it bring glory to God? Am I living, Paul said, whether I eat or whether I drink, whether we live or whether we die, whether we are in good health or whether we're not in such good health, let it be that when people come into our contact, they can see that we are concerned about God's glory being manifested in the earth. Why? Because Jesus said it in this wise, if I be lifted up, I will do what? Draw all men unto me so that God wants to be glorified so that as we live in this life, we lift him up through our life. We lift him up through our deeds, through our talking, through how we behave ourselves, how we conduct ourselves in every manner of conversation. We lift him up and he does what? Draw the world through our example. That's very powerful. Jesus let, gave us a great example of how we should do that. He knew that dying on the cross for the sin of the world would glorify God, and he was willing to submit himself to that death. That's what you and I are called to do. Be willing to submit ourselves to the will of God that he can be glorified through our life. Can I help somebody? Let me go off here just for a minute, and I'll get back. One of the biggest things that I think has hindered many people from their growth in God and the church in general from having the power God wants us to have in the 21st century is that nowadays 
with the teaching and preaching of Christianity, uh, with, with the teaching and preaching of Christendom being so uh, watered down, so to speak. Uh, in other words, there are so many people who are being taught that you just believe in Christ. You just have your Christian card and basically you're in. You've heard me say that many times. And, and there's this mindset that we don't have to do anything because Christ has paid it, paid it all. So we come to Christ with a with, with not the right kind of thinking, if you want to say that, because we have this idea that because Christ did it all, there is nothing else for us to do. Friend, that is the farthest thing from the truth. Jesus gave us an example that he, we should follow his footsteps. We must be willing to submit ourselves to whatever God allows us to endure, to uh, allows us to, to face, to allows us to go through, including COVID, including what comes after COVID including what may come in your life today. We must be willing to submit ourselves to that for the glory of God. That takes a mindset that comes away from thinking about us and thinking about the one who saved us. That's what we need to do, and that's what's important. Let's go on. So glorifying God is our entire purpose, our entire, solamente, numero uno, is the very top priority that we have is to glorify God. That's what we were made for. Let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter number uh, 13 and 14. Uh, before we do that, let's take Isaiah. Yeah, let's go to Isaiah first, 43 and 7, and then we'll get down to Ecclesiastes. Isaiah 43 and 7, even everyone that, that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. Did you get that? Everyone that's called by God's name, if you are a born-again Christian, if you are living in this world, God has created you for his glory, Okay. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. I love that. Okay, look at Ecclesiastes 13, verse uh, ch chapter thir 12, verse 13 and 14, excuse me. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13 and 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter, the entire matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. What is our purpose? We've asked that question. I mean, that question has been asked by people since Adam's day, right? What is our purpose? We know we have one, okay? We can sense that. We just don't know what it is sometimes. Well, we don't have to look any longer. The Bible answers it. Isaiah says it. God said what? For I have created him. Look at that. I have created him, and he tells us for what reason. Who did the creating, and what reason he created us? We were created by God. No, you did not come from apes. No, you did not evolve from a tiny amoeba. No, you d didn't come from the Big Bang Theory. No, you didn't just all of a sudden spontaneously begin to grow and all of a sudden out pop arms and legs and all that. You were created in the image and the likeness of the omnipotent God. You and I need to understand that fact if we're ever, ever going to be able to live to the glory of God. We were created after God's image and his likeness. This is why we are creative beings. This is why we're innovative. This is why we've come up with so many things as it is, because God has given us the likeness of himself. Now, very important here. Look what he says. He says, I've created you. I've made you for my glory, for my praise, for my beauty, to exalt me, to actually bring mention of me in the world. Okay, here's a good thing to think about. How many of us, if we died, would want everybody to forget that we ever lived? Now think about that before you answer, <laughs> okay? None of us would. All of us want to be remembered long after we're gone, if we tell the truth about the matter, right? Okay, so how should we do that? We talk about leaving a legacy. You hear songs written about, we're gonna, what's going to be your legacy when you leave? Well, there's going to be something that you have to impart to people that's going to live on past you. Well, we know that God's never going to die because he's forever and ever, right? But he wanted his glory to proliferate throughout the world forever and ever. And one of the ways he did that was to create human beings in his likeness and his image. So our purpose then is to bring continuous glory to God in our life, through our life, and with our life. Amen? That includes the gifts God gives you. Some people don't realize this. They say, Pastor, I don't have a gift. Yes, you do. Okay? God's given. Did you, did you know this? I mean, we hear a lot about uh, species being extinct, and we hear a lot about people, uh, endangered species. Well, guess what? Human beings are one of the most endangered species that there are because you are unique in your design. Nobody is like you. When you are gone from this earth, there will never be another person that's going to be like you. 
That's that. Think about that. You're the last one of you. <laughs> You're the only one of you. Okay. God has made us that. This is why we need to bring glory to God in all we do. Stop telling people you don't have a gift from God. Quit telling people that you don't know. I don't, you may not know what your gift is, but I can tell you something else. If you're born again of the water and the spirit, you've got the Holy Ghost in you. The Bible says he gave gifts to men. In other words, God, when he ascended on high, when Jesus left, he gave gifts. He departed to the body, which is the church, which is many members. And globally, it considers all the people who are born again and filled with the Holy Ghost, right? Those are the people who are the body of Christ. All these members have unique parts and pieces in their makeup, their, their thinking, the way they do things, whether it's administration, whether it's the gift of the Spirit, whether it's, uh, whether it's a gift of tongues, whether it's prophecy, whether it's the word of knowledge, whether it's healing, whether it's uh, uh, offices and it helps and administrations, whatever it is, God gives every part of his body something to do. So why? For the purpose of bringing him glory. And you and I need to understand that. That's very important, all right? Ecclesiastes says the whole point is for us to keep God's commandments, okay? Have you ever wondered this? Think about this. Have you ever, ever, ever wondered when you try to take the limelight and you feel your little conscience uh, telling you you shouldn't try to hog all the glory of the limelight? If you ever get that feeling in you, here's what it is. It's your conscience and your heart telling you that you're trying to take something that doesn't rightfully belong to you. And that's glory. When you get that sensation that you're trying to be the big head, that you're trying to put yourself in front, you know how some people take pictures and they put themselves in front of the camera and everybody else is in the back and they just like want to they want to hog up the whole camera. Even if they're in the back, they want to hog up the camera. Okay? This camera's not even focusing on them and they're running in the camera and throwing their fingers up and all this other kind of stuff. Why? It's about me, me, me. Those people have a me mindset, okay? Reminds me of the scripture that we read in the Bible when the man, when the Lord called the people and they said, suffer me first to go do this. Suffer me first. Suffer me first. Several times you hear them say that. We need to understand something. When we're trying to do that, our spirit is telling us you're trying to get the glory that really belongs to God. So stop doing it. Amen. That's what our heart's telling us. Our whole duty, our entire responsibility is to live to the glory of God. Are we doing that? Are we trying to do that? That's something we should ask ourselves, isn't it? Are we really living to the glory of God? Let's go on. Now, for the last five or ten minutes of this Bible study, we're going to talk about how do we do that. We know we've talked about what glory is. We've talked about how Paul said, yeah, okay, whether we live or die, no matter what we do, no matter what state we're in, our whole point, let us do everything, Paul said, to the glory of God. We talked about that glory. We talked about God's Shekinah glory. We talked about how God ultimately does everything for his glory, that he made you for his glory. He created the heaven and the earth for his glory. We talked about our primary example, our ultimate example, Jesus Christ, in his livelihood, in his living for three and a Three uh, years of ministry, three and a half years of ministry, 33 short years on this earth. What did he do? He did everything to the glory of God. He, he was about his father's business all the time, from the time he was a young child until the time he left this earth. He was about the father's business to glorify the father. He gave us that example. So then we know then that our purpose is to follow in Jesus' footsteps. As Jesus glorified the father with all his life, our purpose is to do likewise. Like the man said in his article, I just want my life to bring glory to God. No matter whether I live, make it through this cancer or not. This is what we need to think because our entire purpose, our sole focus should be about bringing glory to God. But here's the thing. How do we do that, right? That's what we're going to talk about for the next five minutes. How do we do that? Well, I've given us some ideas. First, we need to be transformed in the mind. If we're going to bring glory to God, we're not going to do it by thinking the way we did before we became children of God. Don't let anybody kid you. If we are children of God, if we are Christians, if we are born-again believers, but we have not been transformed to leave our thinking of the world behind and adopt a new mindset, something is missing. I want you to know that. I wanted to go on record as saying it. Something is missing if we're not transformed and we're not being transformed in the mind, in our thinking. All right? Romans chapter 12, verse 1. It says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of of your mind. Did you get that? That ye may prove. Now he's going to tell us why we need to do this. He's going to tell us why. That ye may prove what is that good and 
perfect and acceptable will of God, right? Acceptable and perfect, okay? Will of God. That's why we're doing it. We're doing it for the glory of God. There is no way, let me help somebody right here, and I don't want you to ever forget what I'm about to say. There is no way we can please God and really bring him glory if we have a mind that's still stuck in the world that was in, that was in before we got saved. There's no way we can do that, okay? Because Paul, Paul said with the mind, we serve the law of God, right? We really serve God with our mind. People don't really understand that sometimes, but it's true. We serve God with our mind. Why? Because what we think is what we become. It defines our character. It leads us to our destiny. It molds and shapes us based on what we allow to percolate, circulate, and to be in our mind. So we got to understand that, that it takes a transformation of the mind. Transform means to change from the inside out. That's what is transformed, okay? When things are transformed, they change in a way that we look and say, that's not what that used to be. That is now something different. So we need to do that by renewing our own mind. Why? Why not just come to God? Now, you've heard this yourself. The Bible says, come, to, come as you are. I've heard many people say that, and you probably have too, even though that's not in the Bible written that way. It's a good thought. Come as you are. Why? We do know the Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 5, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Perhaps that's where people get that from, come as you are. And that's okay. We are to come to God as we are. But nothing in the Bible tells us that we should stay as we are once we get to God. Nothing in the Bible says that or even suggests it. In fact, Paul suggests the other thing. Be renewed. To be renewed means to be made over to be made different, to be brought from one state to another state, renewed by the what? Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That's what he wants us to do. Renewal of the mind is what's important if we're going to actually display the glory of God in our life. It starts with our thinking, and that's what's got to change. The next thing is we need to live as the salt, the light, and the epistles of the world. What do we mean by epistles? Letters to the world. Watch this. Paul, look at Matthew chapter number 5, verse 13 through 16. This is not Paul. This is Jesus talking at the Sermon on the Mount, which is a very popular section of the, of the Gospels, and I'm sure most of you have heard of this. Ye are the salt of the earth. This is what Jesus is saying to those who are following him. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under foot of men. Look at verse 14. Ye are the light of the world, okay? A city that is set up on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and they give it light unto all that are in the house. Look at verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. This is powerful. He uses two things there, salt and light, and we're going to talk about those in a little bit more depth in just a minute. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2, as Paul writes this letter, or epistle as we call them, amen, to the church of Corinth. He says, ye are an epistle. He's talking about the saints. You are a letter, you are a epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men, all right? Now, look at this. During his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus uses those two things. He uses salt and light. Salt and light are two things that the body cannot live without. Right? You agree with that? There's no way to live without salt. I know that nowadays doctors talk about how salt is bad for you, and certain kinds of salt is bad for you, the kind of table salt that we use today is. But when you're talking about natural salt, there's a certain amount of salt that the body must have to be able to maintain certain balances and so on. In addition to that, if you'll do a history search, and we don't have time to go through all that today, but if you'll do a search on salt and look at the history of salt, salt was very valuable in the old days. It was used to rub the baby's skin down to keep them from infections. Salt was used for a number of things, including it was even used not only to season people's food and give flavor to the food. Salt was even so given to soldiers at one point in the history of our world as payment for their labor. Amen. Because they can take that salt and sell it and do various other things, and it was considered very, very valuable. It still is. This is why Jesus uses salt as an example, one of his examples. Then light. We know that light is very important. You know why there are people sometimes who are very depressed? Go to certain parts of the world where the sun doesn't shine very long. You know what those people are doing? Some of them are leaving that those countries as often as they can to go on vacation where they can get some sunlight. 
It causes mass depression. There are countries where people are depressed because they don't get enough sun, right? Light is imperative to our well-being, and we need that. So Jesus uses those two examples that they show us that we should have light. Let your light shine and be the salt of the earth. Salt that is bland or tasteless is useless. Light that has become darkened or looks just like the, the nighttime, you can't even call it light, right? Is useless. So he's telling us, if we're going to bring glory to God, we need to be salt. We need to be the light of the world. And then Paul throws in this next thing. You are an epistle read of all men. Notice this. If you are a born-again believer, I can guarantee you one thing. Somebody's watching you. Somebody is looking at you and they're saying, this person's supposed to be saved. This person says that they're born again saint. Why are they so downtrodden? Why is it that somebody over here who said that God is the God of all gods, the slightest little thing that goes wrong in their life, and they're upset, they're thrown off, they can't function, they can't think. Uh, what's going on there? The world is watching us because we are a written epistle open for the world to see. So while people are looking on, we need to understand this. We need to glorify God in all that we do. This is why you have to live your private life just like you live your public life. Amen. We live downtown just like we live uptown. We live in the store just like we live at home. We live on the bus just like we do if we're in Sunday school. So there's no difference because we are read of all men all the time. This way we give glory to God. And notice what Jesus said. Let your light shine so that men will see your good works and glorify God. Can I help somebody? There's a lot of talk about faith, and faith is a powerful thing, but real faith brings about good works. Don't let anybody kid you. If I have faith, but my works are not righteous, and it's not bringing forth that which is righteous from my lifestyle, then I don't have biblical faith. Very important for us to remember that. Very important. All right, let's go on to the next one. We need to remember that we belong to God. Here's the last thing I want you to remember before we sign off today. Remember that we belong to Christ. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. It says what? What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Sadly, the world does not promote this kind of selflessness, does it? Amen. That when we are born again believers, God calls us to another honor and he encourages us to live as though we don't belong to ourselves. But the world tells us a whole different story. Okay. You've probably even heard, whole, heard people say, I'm just going to do me. You've heard people say, I've heard people say that with, a, with an air of haughtiness, with an attitude. I'm, look, I'm doing me. Okay. Look, well, guess what? You belong to God. So you can't just do you. You can't, I, Brother Bacon, I can't just say I'm just doing me. What do I mean by that? I, I need to understand I'm God's. I belong to him. If whatever I'm doing, it should be done so that God gets glory. Because if I'm talking to somebody in the restaurant in a way that doesn't bring glory, that's not what God wants. I'm focusing on what God wants. See, we've got, this is another reason why our thinking has to change. Because we get this mentality from the world that it's all about me. That I should do what I want to do. And Paul is constantly telling us, no. Don't you know that your body is not yours? Don't you know you have been bought with a price? Okay? When you buy chicken from the store, you don't let the chicken tell you how to cook it. When you buy, buy a steak from the store, you don't, you don't ask the steak, do you want to be barbecued or do you want to be roasted in a pan? You just do whatever you want to do with it because it's your steak. Right? That makes sense to me. So what do we think we should do with our body? See, this is why the Bible says glorify God in your body. Not only does God expect us to have a spirit and uh, that's right, he expects us to honor our bodies. For this reason, we refrain. We don't do marking and tattooing and piercing and cutting and all this stuff to our bodies. Why? Because we want our bodies to be maintained as a sacrifice unto God. It belongs to him. Did you notice in the Bible, and I'll throw this out before I go on, okay? I said this was the last part, but I got one more I got to give you, all right? I'll say this before I go on. If you notice in the Bible, when Jesus was on the cross, and the Bible says that they were going to go break his legs so that they could make sure he was dead, that breaking of the legs would prevent him from rising up on the cross and getting up, being able to breathe a little bit longer, okay? But when they came to Jesus and he had already given up the ghost, they didn't break his leg. So that the scripture could be fulfilled that not a bone of his would be broken. God wanted that body to be the way he wanted it. Not the way the world wanted it. 
even in Jesus' mangled, torn, bruised state, it was significant to God that not a bone of his would be broken. That's very important, okay? Because God wants us to have a body that belongs to him and in the way he wants it, not the way we want it. That's why we honor, protect, preserve, and care for our bodies in a manner that is pleasing to God and brings him glory. That's part of our requirement. That's part of our duty. And God wants that. So our this is the absolute last one. Develop the attributes of Christ. Okay, Colossians 3, 12 through 17. Let's look at what Paul says here. He says, put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, that's pretty powerful, isn't it? So also do ye. You got to forgive people. Look at verse 14. And above all these things, put on charity, love, put on love, okay, which is the bond of perfectness. Look at verse 15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. That's a lot of stuff, isn't it? Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Wow. Look at verse 17. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Wow. Did you get that? There, Paul, the, the more Christ-like we become, the more we glorify God with our lives. Why is this? Because God manifested all of his glory in the person of Jesus Christ. That's why the Bible says he is the express image of God's person, right? Okay, Jesus is that. Paul says in Colossians 2, 8, 9, I think I put that in your notes, he is the fullness of the Godhead. The fullness of the Godhead rests in Jesus Christ bodily. So all of God's splendor, all of his majesty, all of his excellence, all that is God's of his attributes and qualities, boom, he put into the man Jesus Christ so that he would be God with us. That's what's important. So the more we become like Christ in Christ likeness, which are all these attributes that Paul gives us here on in Colossians, right? The more we become like Christ, the more we exemplify and we show that glory in the world that God put in Christ. We demonstrate the glory of God or we exemplify it. And here's that word we learned in the beginning from the Zonda Dictionary. We exhibit the glory of God when we have these attributes. Paul lists like all these different things, humbleness of heart, love, peace, wisdom, forgiveness. If you'll notice, almost every one of these, or most of them, are right out of Galatians chapter number 5, verse 22, which, or they mean the same thing, as the fruit of the Spirit, right? If you'll notice that, you'll see that embodied in these 12 things that Paul lists. But Paul, and he adds a few more extra things in there. But when we have these things, that's when we display the Christ in us. That's when we have the world that can look at us despite what's going on with COVID, despite what's going on with their situation, their family members, despite the turmoil somebody might be in. When they see you suffering, but you're suffering with Christ and you still emanating. When they see you not having a great day or things not going your way, you are still displaying the love of God. You are still displaying the humility of the heart. You're still forgiving people when they do you wrong. Hello? That we are still loving our neighbor. We are still being at peace with one another. We're still forbearing, enduring one another, uh, so that our shortcomings. We're still putting on bowels of mercy. We show compassion for people. No matter what we're going through, God calls us to do what Paul said. Whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. Whether we're suffering or in bondage or in happiness or great spirit, whatsoever we do, we do it all to the glory of God. That is what God wants from you and me. That's what the world needs in a COVID, pre-COVID, or post-COVID environment. The world needs people who will live to the glory of God so that God will be exemplified and God will show himself mighty in the earth. I hope this Bible study helps you. I hope it blesses your heart. I hope it keeps you and causes you to be inspired. Whatever you do, saint, whatever you do, loved one, whatever you do, friend, ask God to help you to live to his glory, because that is our whole duty. We'll see you back here next time. Don't forget, do it God's way, and you'll get God's results. 
in Jesus' name.